Hey everyone, Jeff Dorman, Chief Investment Officer at ARCA, coming back for another edition of That's Our Two Satoshis Live. Joined today by my colleague of now, what, four years running, David Nage. How are you, sir? I'm well, how are you? Uh, Almost four good. years, wow. Yeah, it's been a long time. Looking forward yes. to 40 more. Um, for those who are uh, new to, to talking to us on this uh, uh, Mondays, what we do is we uh, we talk about what we wrote. Um, you know, for those who have been to our blog, ar.ca backslash blog, we write a blog every week called That's Our Two Satoshis, where we talk about what's going on in the market. Uh, and we are going to dive right into that. So for those who want to read the long form, please feel free. But but here's what we have going on in the market right now. So everybody who has spent any time talking about digital assets obviously saw the carnage last week. Um, you know, the largest wealth destruction event uh, in its young history. Um, you know, there have certainly been other events like this in the past, but certainly none of them that have rivaled the amount of, uh, of, of money that was uh, destroyed through Terra Luna and UST. Um, and probably equally important was just how many more eyeballs um, are on this space right now. So, you know, I'm not going to rehash what happened. I think everybody kind of knows what happened with UST and Luna at this point. But, but I, here's what I think is important. And, and David, I'd love for you to kind of jump in with your thoughts as well. Um, I think there's a couple things in terms of takeaways on this, right? First is, is what, what the actual definition of stable coin is. Um, you know, we as an industry like to just come up with names for things and lump everything together, right? You know, for most of the, most of the market likes to lump everything into cryptocurrency, even though it's clear that most digital assets are not currencies at this point. The same thing is true with stable coins. Um, you know, there's a very big difference between a debt-backed stable coin um, like uh, MakerDAO and, and the Dai token versus an asset-backed token like USDC uh, uh, and, 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 and Tether in terms of dollar backing versus an algorithmic stable coin. Um, and I think um, it was a bit of a misnomer to lump all of these into one uh, into one category. And I think you know, even though these are largely self-described categories. Um, Meaning there's no, you know, it, this isn't like a regulated money market where you have to meet certain definitions in order to be called a money market. It's clear the market just picks up on whatever people call it and they run with it. So I think there's going to have to be real rules in place about what you can call certain assets and, and probably equally important, um, you know, a, a market scrutiny and, and industry scrutiny on who gets to just sort of self-describe something as, as whatever they feel like it. What, do you, what, do you, what are your thoughts there? I think it's something that we have talked about a lot over the years internally, and then obviously starting to do that externally is that taxonomy and what you call things matters. You know, in our world, many of our peers call everything crypto. And that's actually what we have, you and I have talked about, you know, publicly as well, too, is that's what we, we don't agree that they actually should be called digital assets. It's a, it's an asset class and it has different sectors. Within those sectors, you have different subsectors. And so that taxonomy actually does matter because it gives clarity as to what things are and what their purpose is. And so I, I, agree, I agree with you that what we call these assets, whether they are an algorithmically backed stable coin or if they are a collateralized stable coin, uh, what we call these things and how we use them in the system absolutely matters. Completely agree. Yeah, for sure. The other thing is, you know, just the sheer size of this, right? So just to put some numbers on this, um, Luna and UST combined was roughly $60 billion at its peak. Um, for some comparison purposes, Enron was $65 billion, Lehman Brothers was $60 billion, and Bear Stearns was $25 billion. Um, all three of those were essentially deemed too big to fail uh, in traditional markets and, and, and were given some form of bailout, um, either in the form of, uh, of, of other companies or, or governments. Um, obviously, nobody bailed out Luna, nobody bailed out UST, nobody bailed out its investors or the industry or everyone else um, who was hurt by this. Um, you know, one of the unintended consequences of creating moral hazard like we have for the last two decades with, with all these bailouts in traditional finance is it fuels excessive risk. Um, but there's a real duality with, with this, right? When you have the traditional finance world that is just constantly expecting there to be a put that somebody will bail you out if you screw up. Versus the digital asset industry, which is much more akin to a forest that just constantly burns down and rebuilds and burns down and rebuilds. Um, you know, the jury is still out in terms of which is ultimately better. I think most of us here in the digital asset space believe very strongly in the burn it down and rebuild stronger than we do in the prop everything up with uh, bailouts until ultimately it's too big and it just kills everything. Um, you know, what are, what are your thoughts there, David, in terms of kind of 
you know, how many times can we die and, and, and you know, have a, a, a phoenix rise from the ashes? Well, cats have nine lives, so hopefully we don't have to go that far. Um, I would say I've seen what you have seen over the years. You know, I've lived through Bear. I've lived through Lehman. I was a young employee in financial services at the time. That was a very scary part of life, you know, going through those. But to your point, in traditional finance, we always know that we have a backstop, that there's a buyer of last resort, that there are those that will not let things deteriorate completely, whether that's because of systemic risk or others. But we know that there's usually a backstop. Within digital assets, we don't have a backstop. Um, and so in many ways, that could be defined as a freer market than what we have today or what we've had over the last 20 years plus is a freer market where you know good things are obviously positively attributed to. And when bad events happen, such as you know bankruptcies and, and the like, they're actually removed from the system. And so it is a very interesting part of the life cycle of digital assets right now that we have witnessed this. Um, I think you have seen that people from traditional finance have questioned why. Why, why isn't there a buyer of last resort? Why aren't there not be, why are there no bailouts? Um, but at the end of the day, these are freer markets. These are not markets that are being you know, suppressed or held up by you know, central banks around the world or by taxpayers like you and I. And so I think it's really interesting that there is a duality there. There is a bifurcation in what's happening. And it is scary. It is painful. Um, but at the end of the day, you hope that the lessons that were learned, that the events that have unfolded, you know, this time and obviously during other times throughout the, the, the life cycle of digital assets, that founders begin to become wiser to that, that founders begin to put in systems in place where, you know, these things cannot happen, that they are built better, they are built stronger, they are built more sustainable. Um, I, that is one of the things that I hope happens throughout this period of time over the next few months is that this is fully diagnosed, that this is, there's a huge postmortem on this and founders really apply the learn, the lessons that are learned here for the future growth for more sustainable types of digital assets. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I think, I think that's the, probably the most important thing is that there, there will be lessons learned, right? You don't learn any lessons when everybody saves you, when there's no savior. You have to learn and, and you have to adapt and evolve. Um, I think there's three major takeaways for me on all this um, before we turn it over back to you in terms of what we're seeing in the venture world. But, um, you know, one, I don't think the probability of stablecoin regulation increased as a result of this. I think it was already inevitable and it had a 100 percent chance that uh, stable coins would be re uh, uh, regulated. I think the only thing that changed is the speed with which this will happen. So, you know, that's a long term uh, uh, good for the market that this is going to uh, uh, speed up what was inevitable anyway. Um, the second thing I think is, is, is real important is that everyone's calling this a Ponzi. Um, a Ponzi scheme implies intent, right? It implies that you have no chance or, or thought in terms of how uh, uh, you will ever make, every, make investors whole and that the whole point is to you know, harm the last people in relative to the first people in. We got to be careful with words like that, right? The Luna UST peg mechanism was experimental, but very transparent, right? There was strong supporters and there were strong critics. Uh, many consumers and investors avoided the risks. Many took the risks and decided the risk reward was worth it and saw a path to inevitable sustainability. Um, to me, this was not a, a Terra Luna Ponzi. To me, if we really want to you know, point fingers or figure out how you fix this, um, the issue is those who didn't know the risks at all. And that largely, as usual, falls on retail investors. So to me, this is a failure, uh, uh, not necessarily of Luna, but the supporting companies and exchanges and DeFi platforms and backers that allow unsuspecting consumers to trade these assets without adequate disclosures. Um, you know, it's no different than, than ICP, you know, Definity, when it came to market uh, a, a year ago. And the token fell 90% due to the fact that, you know, insiders and, and institutional investors knew that the supply and unlocks was insane. But the people coming into the exchanges to buy it didn't know that. Um, I think a lot of this can be fixed um, with just better information, right? People are not stupid. People just lack information sometimes. And it's not that difficult for the companies and projects that are benefiting uh, from all this retail participation to put better disclosures on there. Um, and lastly, um, you know, I think 
the 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 other thing that we'll be talking about for the future is just the resiliency, right? And and you know, look, I, I'm well aware that a trillion dollars has been wiped out of the market cap in the last um, you know couple of months here, uh, and that you know every digital asset was hit in this uh, in, in in as as a residual of what happened with Terra Luna, and that. You know, we're still not out of the woods yet, right? People are probably going to continue to try to take runs at Tether. And, you know, the rumor mill of who's blowing up is going to be rampant. Um, you know, there was plenty of companies and projects that will end up being collateral damage here, some of which we'll never hear from again. Others will, you know, again, rise from the ashes spectacularly. But, you know, I, I really truly believe that each time we burn down, but the protocols work and the systems work as designed and you know, uh, 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 stable coins still exist and DeFi still exists and play to earn still exists and all these things that have been created still exist. That's a win. That's a win for the, for where we're headed, which is a real web 3.0, uh, world. So, you know, not, not trying to sugarcoat how bad the losses were for a lot of people out there. Um, but certainly, you know, there is a real path to future viability. And I think these learning, these lessons that are learned are a big part of that story. Yep. Yeah, if um, I always like to look at history, I'm kind of a internet geek, if you will. I like to look at history of things that have happened. And some people equated this to our dot-com bubble bursting. Um, and if you look at it, you know, in the early days, you had uh, early days of Mosaic. And then Mosaic obviously led to Netscape. Um, Netscape was with early browsing. You had, you know, obviously the advent of, uh, kind of message boards and communication that way. Um, then you had the likes of Amazon in the late nineties, and then you had the dot-com bubble. Um, and what happened is obviously you had a massive amount of, you know, obviously exuberance, if you will. Um, but from those ashes, which eventually occurred, uh, in the early parts of 2000, you had, Companies that we use every single day, Google, Netflix, Amazon, the likes, you had all of those effectively come from that period of time when, you know, there was media and reporters out there that said the Internet was dead. Um, obviously, it wasn't. And obviously, use cases became incredibly exceptional to the point where if you're running any type of business today, if you don't have a website and a presence there and e-commerce, you're basically non-existent. So... Yes, you know, there are periods that this has happened, not just in, in Web3 and digital assets, but have happened in parts of our lives and our society with the Internet that we just take for advantage these days because so many people are far removed from it. It's us old timers who can be, you know, continue to remember those periods of time when, you know, everyone said that <laughs> obviously that didn't happen. Um, and so very similarly speaking, I think that's exactly what's going to happen here is that what happened in 2018 when we had, quote unquote, crypto winter, you know, this was a period of time, obviously, as you know, from, you know, the, the liquid side where Bitcoin was at its all time high of 21,000, the Q4 of 2017, and then obviously capitulated down to depths many haven't seen before. And in Q1 of 2018, people ascribed that, you know, crypto and digital assets were dead. During this time, though, if you look at the, the, the fundraising that happened and the rounds and the companies that came out of the 2018, you have the likes of Fireblocks, which is now a, a unicorn uh, valued at several billion dollars. You have OpenSea, which has obviously become one of the Amazons of NFTs where they have billions of dollars of volumes of NFT activity that happened there month over month for the last 12 months. Uh, you have Blockdaemon and many others. I can keep going on. And so it's these times when, you know, a lot of the, the the attention kind of fades when builders and founders really take the time to really build our future. Yeah, I think that's I think that's well said. And I think it's also a really good segue to the next thing that we wrote about in, in this week's uh, update. And, and for those who don't know, Arca has a lot of different business lines uh, besides asset management. And then even within asset management, Arca has a lot of different fund strategies. Uh, David Nage runs our, our uh, Endeavor Fund, which is an early stage venture portfolio where, where he's been investing in and supporting founders uh, in the digital asset ecosystem now. Um, you know, you wrote a lot about the future of 
Well, really the, the elephant in the room, right? The elephant in the room is when are private valuations going down and how are these private valuations so high relative to what's going on in public tech and, you know, public digital assets and everything else. Yep. You know, what, what, do you, what are you seeing? What are you thinking? You know, what, what are the few takeaways that everyone listening to this should, should come away with with regard to how you're thinking about shaping a portfolio and how you're helping founders, you know, be able to be that next success story that you're talking about? Yeah, I would say that a lot of that came from a very simple tweet that got very popular, even when Jeff Bezos retweeted it from Bill Gurley from Benchmark, where he said that over the course of the last 12 years has been an incredible bull run in the public equity side, and that an unlearning process was going to happen for founders. And so I really started to pull from that and thought about what an unlearning period would be and why that would be an unlearning period. And if you look at it, you know, right now, you've had this last 12 plus years of this bull run on the equity side from the traditional equity side, really be facilitated by quantitative easing. Uh, you look at it, there's been about $25 trillion that have been uh, put into markets since uh, the, the days of the Lehman crisis back in 08, 09, uh, to this point now. Um, and so if you look at the correlation there between that activity and obviously the equity bull run. It is, it is fairly tight there in terms of the correlation. So now that we're entering into this new period, we believe, in terms of quantitative tightening, where we are seeing central banks, especially uh, in the U.S., the Fed, start to raise rates and try to get inflation under control, whether they are uh, behind the curve on that or not, is obviously something that is of conjecture. People have their opinions. Obviously, I think that they are behind the curve. Um, and so, you know, you have a period right now where you have quantitative tightening coming into the into the market, whereas the uh, weighted average cost of capital or for leverage purposes, you know, if you're a company out there, you're trying to get debt, that debt is now costing more than it ever has before. And so this all has a trickle down effect. So if you look at the, the public markets, you've seen them under market contraction over the course of the last few months. Uh, and that has obviously been related to uh, a lot of the contraction that you have seen uh, in the digital asset space. You and I have talked about correlations between tech stocks, between gold, between everything else that everyone looks at from correlations. But if you look at the correlation between you know the the tech stocks and the Nasdaq and obviously digital assets, it's been tighter than it's been before in many years. I think about a 0.8 or 0.9. So we're very correlated to that, and so. You have a lot of factors from the, the macro side that are affecting valuations on the public equity side. And if you look at things, even in terms of performance of VC-backed companies that have recently gone public, you have a firm that went public in January of 2021 at a price of $49 a share. Their IPO valuation was $11.9 billion. And as of today, I looked, their share price is $23 a share with a market cap of six and a half, so about a 50% haircut. You have Oscar Health which IPO'd in March of 2021 at a price of $39 a share with an IPO valuation of $7.9 billion. And as of today, it's pricing at $6.30 a share at a market cap of $1.3 billion. This has an effect. Um, and so when you look at venture, you know, there are usually two different ways, you know, at, as an investor, you look at kind of exit strategies or monetizations. Um, you look at them from an IPO perspective. Does a company get to go public? Or is the company get uh, bought out in an M&A activity? And so these are the two primary drivers. Um, and if you're an early stage investor, these are the things that you look at because as an early stage investor, you're taking on the preponderance of risk. Um, so you have to look at these things to, to as part of your stipulation for justification of taking on that risk. And so you look at that and then you look at what's happening in terms of, as I said, kind of global macro and kind of the, the monetary and economic policies that are happening right now. There are two different things that you can look at. You can look at a soft landing where effectively you're, you're looking at the Fed slowing aggregate demand by you know, and inflation by raising rates to a level where they think that they're pricing with the markets, you know, maybe about 3% without causing a recession. And then you have potentially a deflationary recession where, you know, inflation remains stubbornly high. Um, but effectively, the Fed rates, you know, you know, come to a restrictive level to a point where, you know, the, the consumers out there kind of lower themselves. And so you have two different kind of scenarios there that are affecting these things. And so what I was kind of alluding to in, in the writing and what I'm kind of talking to in terms of founders is that for the first time in many, many years, you know, and as I said, this is all kind of off of Bill's you know, tweet about unlearning. 
is that founders are dealing with an environment that is not so quantitatively eased. It's more tight. You have more economic pressures today. You have public markets that are you know, under contraction. And so this is a different paradigm shift than we've ever seen before. And so it's a time where you know, looking at pragmatism may actually be the way of uh, success. Yeah, that all makes sense. And I think, you know, I, maybe incorrectly, I think um, uh, uh, maybe the view of some venture capital investors is that they're not necessarily being pragmatic all the time. And, and, and I think what I'm hearing from you is, you know, look, you're making transformational bets on companies and projects, what they're going to look like three to 10 years from now. Getting too hung up over the minutia of the price of that asset today is maybe less relevant than making sure that you invest in things that are set up for success and can handle a tough environment, right? Like the, you know, the difference between a 40 million valuation or a 60 or a 30, maybe less relevant than do they have the runway? Do they have the ability to withstand a long uh, a period of time with tougher financing costs and, and maybe potentially customer exits and, um, you know, everything in between. Right. So, you know, I think that's, that's, you know, important to recognize the difference between, you know, what we're doing in liquid markets versus what we're doing in, in, in private markets and, and, and how these companies and projects, you know, can set themselves up for future success, even if the outlook, you know, over the next three to six months is, is, is uncertain at best. Um, so let me, let me ask you this, David, just sort of in, in, in closing here, um, you know, as you have founders reaching out to you, and again, you know, for those who want to reach out to David, I encourage you to at David Nage on Twitter, and obviously you can find us at, at AR.ca on our website as well. But, um, you know, what are you encouraging founders to do who are, are coming to you now? Or, or what, what is something that, that companies and projects can do to, to really get on your radar right now, given the tough environment? You know, we're looking at, you know, and it, it is a cliche, but infrastructure, how do these things, how does everything work together, whether that's interoperability or composability, whether that's wallets, whether that's UI, UX, um, a lot of those features are important in overall usage. How do we actually get to 100 million users or a billion users of digital assets? Is it simply by having some sort of a build-in with an Apple wallet? Uh, is it something where it creates um, an interoperability feature that allows, you know, gaming on, on Avalanche or, you know, Solana-based DeFi to work together, things like that? You know, how does that all work together? Because another thing that we take for granted is that when you run a Google search, for instance, there are seven or eight different processes that happen underneath the hood. All of a sudden, within milliseconds, you get your results. But there are things that are happening underneath the hood those things that are happening underneath the hood in Web3 are what we really care about, what we're really looking for. Um, those are the things that will become the next Oracle network, for instance, where it is highly dependable on the success of digital assets. Those things never go away. Um, and so you know, those are the things that we really look for in, in, in the next future of Web3. And in terms of founders, what we're really talking to them these days is when they are raising, you know, try to obviously, you know, work with investors that are being prudent and pragmatic, you know, working, you know, to ensure that you have, you know, a good amount of runway to your point about 12 to 18 months of runway to obviously weather whatever's happening right now in the markets, um, making sure that you're being very consistent and that you're being mindful of your overhead, uh, getting the right hires in place right now. Uh, these are all things that you can do today to ensure success for the next, you know, 12 to 18 to 24 months. Um, as I said, 2018 was a dire time in, in the SASA class in this world where the majority of people wrote off crypto. Um, but, you know, obviously from that time, if you look back, and as I said, you had some of the biggest companies come out of that time very successful and were you know, now key parts of infrastructure like Fireblocks. This is a time where you'll be able to do that and the amount of capital that's available for you to do that in terms of the, the funds like ours and others out there. You have more, you know, capital, you know, and found and investors today than you ever have before in the history of this of this asset class. So there's a lot you can do, um, but there's obviously investors that like us who are going to work tirelessly for you, uh, and we actually do that. We talk to our founders every month. We check in. We give them access to our network. We get them on our, my podcast called Base Layer. We do everything that we can to amplify their voice and their mission. And those are the types of investors that, especially during tough markets, you want to have at your at your bench. Great. 
Well, look, a lot going on in the market right now. David Nage, as always, great talking to you. Appreciate you joining. Uh, for those listening, again, you can check out our blog at ar.ca backslash blog and read the whole piece that we wrote, uh, which this week was called uh, Will a Phoenix Rise from the Ashes Again? Uh, and obviously, you can reach out to myself on Twitter at jdorman81 and David at David Nage. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you next week.